Hi everyone and welcome to In Deep Geek. This is a slightly different format for this uh, episode uh, and it's a very special guest is the reason. As my special guest today, I have got the one and only Bear McCreary. Bear, do you want to say hi? Hey gang, how's it going? I'm excited to be here. Excellent. And for anyone who doesn't know, and you should know, Bear is the composer of uh, Lord of the Rings, the Rings of Power soundtrack. Um, and uh, what I wanted to do, we've, we've got you for, for a while, so hopefully we can get into some detail about this, is to use this time to dig into not just the music itself, but the, the process of creating this, how this interacts with what we're seeing, how does this sort of add some value to what we're seeing, um, where might this go in the future? So um, if that's all right with you, the, the one thing I did want to say just to start off with was I asked people, my patrons and a few others, knowing I was going to be talking to you, uh, I said, what do you want me to ask? And I did get quite a few questions. I'll incorporate them here. But the overwhelming thing uh, they wanted me to say, and it echoes how I feel, is thank you. Uh, congratulations. This is uh, exactly what we wanted from this soundtrack. This does, for me at least, it brings me back into Middle Earth. So thank you. Oh, thank you for the kind words. And that um, endorsement um, echoes everything I've seen online. Uh, and it just means the world, you know, I mean, I, uh, I, that's exactly what I wanted to do is have a chance for all of us fans to immerse ourselves back into middle earth. And as a fan of the adaptations, as well as the source material, the music is, is part of that. So I thought I have a chance to, to, to do what so many other composers have done, uh, and, and write music that helps us kind of exist in, in Middle Earth, and that's that's pretty awesome. So it means a lot. Thank you. Well, I, good. I'm glad that you have heard that from other people as well, because this is for all of the good and bad things about the show, and I personally think the good well outweighs the the bad. But the one thing I've heard everybody say is that they appreciate the music. So um, I, I think that that's uh, something you should be very proud of. But let's start at the beginning of this. Um, I know you are a Tolkien fan. You have been a Tolkien fan for some time. So when you got the the call, however it came to you, actually, I'll be interested. That's the first question. How did you find out you've got the gig? Um, so, uh, yeah, the show was announced in 2017, I think. And the first thing I thought was, oh, my God, like I, I'm the guy for this. How could whoever <laughs> is running this show not know then it's like, it's gotta be me, man. It's gotta be me. Cause I, I felt like not only do I just love the source material, but I also thought, okay, any famous film composer would have, would get a shot at this. I, I mean, to mm. me, it's a no brainer that it's like, you know, you'd go to Howard Shore and if not him, it'd be like Michael Giacchino or Hans Zimmer, like D Danny Elfman, who would say no to this? But then I started thinking of all the people on that list, how many of them, have written their best work under a television schedule for years on end. And then I was like, oh, maybe the people making this show are going to have to approach this a little differently. And then I started thinking like, well, but then there's a, there's a, a body of work that I've at that time had been 15 years. It's been basically 20 now. I've been working in TV and, and that's really where I honed my craft. I learned how to write music that I'm proud of, write it really fast. Um, and, and then I thought like, wow, you know, maybe, maybe that list isn't as long as I, as I think it's going to be. Um, I did a movie. Um, I'll just point it over here. I did a movie uh, called 10 Cloverfield Lane. There it is. I got the poster right up there. Awesome. Uh, 10 Cloverfield Lane is um, a bad robot film that I did. Uh, and it was produced by, um, J.J. Um, Abrams was a producer and really hands-on. Uh, Dan Trachtenberg, who just did Prey, was the director, his first feature. And there was a young producer named Lindsay Weber there, who uh, I ended up working with a few times on some other bad robot projects. And she texted me, I think in 2018 or maybe 19, that she had left Bad Robot. And I said, oh, Lindsay, why? It's such a great place to work. And she goes, I'm producing this other thing now, this Lord of the Rings show. Uh, and then I, it, that's when it kind of got real for me. I was like, whoa, there's like somebody I know mm. well. Um, and then you, you know, we just kept in touch and, and you, know, you fast forward a few more years, the pandemic slowed down their um, decision-making process for post-production because they had to, they had to get this on, you know, on film, so to speak. Um, 
but then finally that that was the connective tissue i think was that like my body of work in television specifically i think makes me a candidate for this but it was that Lindsay saw me work with jj and dan and julius ona on cloverfield paradox like and 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 i think that that there's a lot of sort of bad robot peripheral people um jd payne and patrick mckay did a lot of work at bad robot and Lindsay, having worked under um jj there just kind of saw like oh yeah that's that's how you make a show that's how you make a movie you want you assemble people the way jj did you give them autonomy you trust in them. Everybody is contributing creatively to every aspect and you just put your creatives in a room and they make something great because they're passionate about it. And I think that, you know, I had fit in, in that environment. So that, I mean, that's it, right? I mean, it's like, did I do, was it because I'd had a 20 year career in genre TV or, or just cause I'd worked with Lindsay Weber twice or, or some balance of those. But I think that's, that's um, why I was uh, like, in terms of my industry ranking and my mm. career, that's why I got the call. But in my heart, I got the call because, like, <laughs> man, I I I love this material so much, and the movies in particular were like so profoundly influential on me in an in an interesting time in my creative life. Um, that they were like the last piece in a way because I was in my early twenties. I was just graduating college when those came out, um, they were not like the foundational core of my being. They were like the very last piece of the puzzle mm. in a way. They were the end of my childhood. You know what I mean? I think that for people my age, it's like we grew up on star Wars and then it's like Jurassic park and, and you know, the matrix. And then it's like Lord of the Rings was like after, cause after Lord of the Rings, I was a grown up. I saw those movies and I thought it wasn't just that I was a kid. It's like, I want to make movies like those people. I watch those behind the scenes um, appendices more than the movies. I would just put them <laughs> on like a loop all the time in my little apartment. And I was, I just thought those are my people. There are, those are people that are like obsessive about what they do the way I am. Even I knew that about myself even then. So I just felt like this calling, like one day I want to do something like Lord of the Rings. Well, uh, that's a, a fascinating sort of segue into the, uh, question i'd love to ask you because of the movies and the movies from your perspective the soundtrack obviously legendary uh, howard shaw whenever people think about middle earth they're thinking those tunes the rohan tune the shire tune whatever that's there how and and howard was involved in this in as much as he did the theme to it uh, and you did everything else so for those who aren't aware of where the, the dividing line is that that was your separate obviously uh working together but you you did the, the different bits how do you work I, I mean in the shadow is the wrong way of saying this but you will have been aware of that did you try and pick up the themes from it did you try and reflect it did you try and start again from scratch how does that process work it, it's it's an interesting thing to think about verbalizing because i I'm not quite sure what the answer is. The truth is I didn't think about it. I didn't think about it because I can't get out of bed in the morning and say, well, today I need to write something that will be as beloved as Howard Shore's, <laughs> you know, Shire theme. I would just pull back under, under the covers and huddle in a fetal position and cry if that's what I was thinking. So out of necessity, I had to not do that, but that's also not mm. the way my brain is wired. I, um, I am, I've been influenced by his uh, Howard Shore's uh, scores for The Lord of the Rings on everything I've done since Lord of the Rings came out. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm like this sponge for music that I love, and I've always been that way. And as I mentioned before, Howard's work in Lord of the Rings was sort of like the last piece of the puzzle that kind of formed my um, foundational orchestral influences um, that really began with with Jerry Goldsmith and John Williams, Elmer Bernstein, Ennio Morricone, Nino Rota, Danny Elfman, Basil Polidorus, James Horner, Shirley Walker. Um, and it's like, you know, Howard was always on my radar. I thought Silence of the Lambs was super cool. I wasn't like watching a lot of the Cronenberg movies when I was 10, you know? So so I was a little late to the mm. Howard War party until Lord of the Rings came out. Um, so in that way, it's like all of those composers seeped into my brain. 
Um, and in a way, what I wanted to do is go back to, in order to do this, I wanted to just go to like a really magical place in my imagination. It was not, I think it would have been cynical of me to emulate Howard Shore. Mm. Ultimately, I think it would have been, and, and, and because I knew that he was going to write this majestic main title, we're going to get the real deal there. I didn't want any part of the score to feel like an impersonation or an exercise. And also, I'm honestly, that's not my skill set. I'm not good enough. But, like, but were, you, were you perhaps subconsciously, sorry, were you perhaps subconsciously echoing some of the, I mean, the instruments? So, for example, when absolutely. you get the, the, the Harfoots, the, there's a lot of the same instruments and feel mm -hmm. is, is from the Shire. Was that? Can I, can I tell you? So, all right. So let me just tell you how I, you're right. Yeah. You're right. That it's all subconscious. And it's not just that like, oh, I'm choosing to have an influence from Howard Shore here, but it's like, I can't not choose to do that. I can't shut that mm. off. It's always in there. Here's how I know that's the case. So I, um, I've been sharing Lord of the Rings with my daughter now. Uh, I say now because she's eight. And when she was seven, I couldn't even tell her I was doing a thing called Lord of the Rings. She would just say it to her school friends. So for a year, I mean, the secrecy on this was absurd. In my own house with my wife, we were speaking in code at the dinner table. <laughs> How's it going on that Untitled Project? Untitled Project's going okay, kicking my ass today, you know? So finally, now that, you know, my daughter came to Comic-Con and she saw uh, the trailer and then now she loves the show, we're reading The Hobbit together. Um, Fantastic. She loves Rings of Power, right? So I also showed her the Peter Jackson trilogy. She had never seen it. Um, but the other thing of mine that she had consumed a lot of is God of War. I don't know why she loves God of War. She loves the, <laughs> she loves the games. We're, we're on our third playthrough. She's like, Dad, I want to play God of War. And it's like, okay, you know, it's... Um, so, but check this out. In the two towers, I can tell we get to Rohan and she's like... Huh, she's almost like sitting up and there's a... we in about halfway through the movie, we cut to um, Helm's Deep. The Hardinger fiddle with a bunch of reverb on it over a drone. And you know what my daughter says to me, Robert? She goes, that sounds like your music, Dad. <laughs> and I was like, that's because it got a war. Do you know what I mean? Like, that is her having no context at all, hearing a lonely nickel harpa or a Hardinger yeah. I add nickel harpa, but a lonely Nordic instrument over a rich orchestral harmony. And she's like, dad, that sounds like you. So that's when my first evidence that like, this is happening on like a DNA level that my music is influenced by all of these things, including Lord of the Rings in a way that I can't shut off. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because because some of the the themes that we've got going on here, um, and I want to unpick the themes a little bit more in just a moment, but some of them are clearly connected very strongly with the, the Lord of the Rings and the things that we know. Some of them are new, like Numenor, for example. Well, there's, um, there's thought put into all that. The, yeah. Some are, you're correct. Some are new. Some are connected. None of that is by accident. What do you mean by that? Well, um, the the motto that I sort of came up with for what I wanted this to be for my experience as a fan, which is my litmus mm. test for everything. I don't think about your experience. I think about our experience. What do I want to hear when I watch the show? Is um, continuity, not quotation. Quotation of Howard Shore's music was legally not an option. So... I am not allowed to do that as of right now. When the powers that be tell me that I can, I can. Um, but that also means then that in a way that was liberating because our story takes place so with such a distance of time that I wanted the experience to be continuous. There are so many examples of this um, where, uh, you know, the Harfoots. Um, mm. if, I were, if I were able to quote the Shire theme, I wouldn't. Why? Okay. Because it's the Shire. It's not mm. the theme for the hobbits in my heart. It's the theme for that place. And we're not in that place. And these aren't the hobbits. So the to me, if you, the minute you hear, da -da 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 -da, I'm, I can picture the set in New Zealand right now. Yeah. Which would be thematically inappropriate 
and it would just be straight up wrong for this story that's not where they are yet. So what but, I but, would, but would, uh, if we're going down this theoretical, you say you yeah. don't have the legal rights to it anyway. Imagine you did suddenly have the legal rights to it and Howard Shaw gave his blessing and, and all of the things said you could do this. Later on, whenever we get there, something like the One Ring happens. Would you would you want to do a little nod to those themes there, or would you want Here, to make this all your own? Here's an example. Yeah. That one's tricky. That one comes with an asterisk, and we can talk about it. Okay. But let's say, and I am only speculating as a fan. I know mm -hmm. nothing about this. Don't at me, bro. I'm not okay. spoiling anything. <laughs> that the last scene of the Harfoots in our show is them finding a place. Look at this lovely place. Let's call it the Shire. Do you know what I mean? Like, let's, uh -huh. let's start digging holes in the ground and living in them. You know, all things being equal there. Do, 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 credits. That would be awesome. Do you know what I mean? Like, Absolutely. Be like, yes, now we're handing the baton. Whether or not that happens I am creating an emotional experience that's continuous with that. Continuous. Sure. The Harfoot theme has a, the a sort of proto-Celtic British vibe, where Howard Shores is very British with hints of Celtic. Um, mm. Sounds like Ralph Vaughan Williams. It sounds um, settled. It sounds comfortable. It sounds like a. Pl it sounds comfort comforting. And we're on the road in a very dangerous environment, and our sense of comfort comes from being able to like plant roots get a little tradition, but then we gotta, we gotta move. So in the Harfoot theme, there's also these wooden mallet instruments. They're West African instruments called balafons among claves and log drums. The idea is telling that they're walking around, they're picking up logs, maybe playing them, and then they gotta leave them and move on. Mm. There's something nomadic about that color to me, especially because we see them living in these very wooded environments, at least in the first few episodes. And and then Nori's theme is more Celtic, is more specifically the 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 Harfoot elements are in the background, and it's like there's a there's a lush Celtic harmony in the strings. There's a penny whistle that's doing a, a tune that is just more evocative of what Howard did with the Hobbits. In a way, if someone's watching this, going, "Is this our Frodo? Is this mm. our Hobbit? Is this our Harfoot who's going?" to leave the comfort of the society and go on a big adventure? Well, yeah. Do you know what I mean? That's by design. That is a continuous experience. So my idea is that whether or not I'm legally able to quote anything, mm. it I am, I am prepared for an emotional experience either way, that when you watch the entire show one day, say you get 50 hours of this, and then you go right into the Peter Jackson films, that on an emotional level, you would understand, oh, with the minute you hear the Shire, you're like, that reminds me of the Harfoots, but but it's more comfortable. It's more settled. Mm. They've been here for a while. Do you know what I mean? Uh, and then and then yeah, we could talk about Numenor for an hour, but <laughs> Numenor is is really obvious. That's where it's new. Why is it mm. new? I want you to fall in love with it. I want you to connect with it. I want it to feel like this is part of Middle Earth so that when you go to the Howard Shore scores through the Peter Jackson films, it's almost shocking that this foundational color of Middle Earth is just extinct. It's gone. Um, its absence is something that will be striking. And that's part of the continuity, or in the case of Numenor, a lack thereof. I, I think that's fascinating. I just... I would at some point, I'd love to, to see a conversation between you and a, a, a Tolkien linguistic expert about the Celtic thing, because uh, Tolkien's relationship uh, philologically with the Celtic sort of languages and feel is a really complex one. And it is, he did, although he was very much wanting his world, his creation to be sort of redolent of the England and the hither parts of Europe, I think, is the way that he, he tended to, to call it. The, he, he definitely had a sort of an undercurrent of almost lost Celtic uh, culture going on there. Yes. And let's just let's address that for one second, because I find that, you know, I've done a lot of research into this when I did Outlander. And there's a, a dance of this sort of druidic culture. And I reached out to experts 
and mm. who I know from doing black sales and Da Vinci's demons. I'm, I'm, I love doing this kind of research. And I was like, Hey, what are some, you know, words and music from the Druids? And everybody laughed at me. They're like, there are none. It's mm. only survived in popular cultural reimaginings in, in, in Arthurian legend, all of which is more recent. Um, which is to say that, and the same thing can be said for like the music of ancient Greece, of Egypt, ancient Egypt, Babylon, Mesopotamia. And if you think about it, the distance in time between our society and those, the ones that have been erased by time when it comes to sound and mm. spoken language and music, we can speculate. It's, you know, thousands of years, say two, but really like four to 10,000 years. That's kind of similar to the second age. It's mm. that long ago that, that in a way, again, if I had the ability to quote the Gondor theme when we yeah. come into Numenor, I think that would be unfair to our story because it's like, that's thousands of years later that the idea that you could say, oh, there's the Gondor theme again. Yes, it would trigger member berries and nostalgia for movie fans, but it's like, wouldn't the actual music of Numenor be so long faded and different that it's like the idea that it had these different colors, just like the music of Babylon and Mesopotamia, we can only guess. I find we, that very inspiring that it, that it, you, it, that I wanted the music of the second age to feel ancient because to the third age stories, it would be. Hmm. One, one thing just, um, I knew this interview was just going to go off in random directions, not where I planned it, but anyway, this is good. But, but just uh, thinking about the architecture of Numenor, uh, one thing that I've certainly noticed, I know a few others have, is that, and this may well come from John Howe's visual landscape here, but the architecture of Numenor, you can see echoes of that with, if you look at things like Minas Tirith in, in the films. And that's partly, I suspect, because... He's doing. Did you this, notice but... that the, the, the in um, fourth or fifth? Forgive me. Uh, you see the statues. One of the statues that looks like the Argonaut, right? But, oh yeah, absolutely. It, yes. Like, Welcome. You know his exactly. hand. Just that difference. Uh, you know, as opposed to this. You know. You, you yeah. know. It, it. It's so striking. Um, and again, it's like yes, those similarities are there. The DNA, the connective tissue is there, but it's not just quoting it it's a lot like when you see that the you know the sort of palace or senate building at the heart of um of, of, of Numenor in the third episode I mean if you've seen an image from Return of the King it should evoke that mm. but I also feel like again I feel if I just splashed the Gondor theme over that which I couldn't do anyway you know, no, of course. <laughs> but, you know, but even if I did in a way it's it it is, it's almost like backwards. It's mm. like, it's like, it is almost because those movies mean so much to us. It's almost like in, intuitively you'd understand like, oh, well that's, that's influenced from Return of the King, which it's like this, it's chronologically wrong. You want something that feels so ancient and majestic and has the seeds that it's like, oh, I can understand that. And as much as I talk about Mesopotamia and ancient Egypt, and I could get into all the instruments that are in the Numenor theme that are evocative of that. There's also what I just called like that Camelot element, mm. that brass that is doubling all that stuff that is arrangement wise. It's, it's very much like the Gondor theme, you know, like it's not, it, it, it's all connected in there. And, and I, I think that heightens the experience. I mean, I, I, I the headline here, there are so many bad versions of 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 nostalgia that could have gotten into this show. And I find it amusing online seeing people freak out about things that are non-canonical, which I get, I understand. But in a way, like I'm like, gang, it could have been the hot, sexy young Aragorn adventures. Do you you <laughs> think you think that wasn't seriously considered? You, you think that like the worst, most cash grabby, cynical, tie it into the movies we know and make it something that can be recycled for years. The fact that Amazon went with these guys 
to tell this story. Do you know what I mean? Like, so in a way, the opportunity to to, to make a, a, a Numenorian theme and and just whisper to that Gondor theme instead of just quoting it in a TV show. As a fan, personally, that's what I am, am enjoying. That's what I'm enjoying seeing. That's what I wanted to see. The minute the show was announced, the first thing you thought was, are they going to tell the same story? Are they high? Nobody wanted that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I'm rambling, man. Ask me more questions. No, no. All right. Uh, happily. Well, I'm not. Before we move on, I'm not going to let you get away with just the. And there's an asterisk to that next to the One Ring thing. What What was the asterisk next to the the, the right. One Ring? The asterisk is um, if I am legally allowed to quote the One Ring thing at the end of the show, I won't. First of all, okay. I probably won't be. But second of all, it's too late. That ship has sailed. I have a new One Ring thing. You've already heard it so many times you don't even understand how many times you've heard it in the five episodes, six episodes you've seen. I'm playing long game on this. And it's just seeping into your brain. Before this season is done, you will understand more clearly what that is. And then, you know, we got a lot of rings to make before we get to that last one. So again, I think by the time we get there, again, only speculating, only speculating, but many episodes will it will occur before we before we get to the the one ring uh you're going to you're going to have an emotional experience with a theme that i've created specifically for that emotional experience and then to take away from that by then going oh remember the movies remember and 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 man let's be real man there's people watching the show that like are going to find the movies later you know mm. so yes that would have been wonderful if from moment one, I could have said, hey, we got that theme cleared. But second of all, like, legally, dudes, it's not going to happen. It, it is okay. not. Whatever you think needs to happen for those rights to get cleared, assure, rest assured, everyone with all the resources in the world tried to make that happen. This is not, this was not a, like, a light decision. Um, and in a way, I went into this going, because that was the first thing I asked. Can I use oh. these themes? Once that isn't the case, to me, I'm like, all right, I'm switching gears. I'm going into a blessing in disguise. And if I'm not going to be able to quote that iconic ring theme, I'm going to do everything I can to craft something that seeps into your brain. I'm not going to make a big announcement about it early um, and, and, and make something that's satisfying. And at the end of the day, if fans that are my age, our age, if they go at the end like, the show is good, but the one ring theme's not as good. I'll be like, yeah, I get it. You know what I mean? Like, I'm sorry. <laughs> like, I, you know what I mean? Like, I can't, that, th that, those themes had 20 extra years that I'm not going to have. Um, and, and, and I get it. I might feel the same. You know what I mean? That's an iconic theme. Absolutely. Well, I'm I'm fascinated by this idea that we've already heard uh, hints of it already, not just once or twice, but all Robert, over the place. Go back in the first episode. There are two but two extremely obvious places that you'll go wow. back and watch it and be like, it's literally staring you in the face. Episode one. Okay, guys, if you're watching this, feel free to put down in the comments any speculation you've got there. This is uh, this will go out after episode <laughs> six. Uh, so yeah, uh, uh, yeah. feel, feel free to speculate for your lives. Um, but I want to talk about this. So you, you were given this blank canvas uh, basically you were you were told you've got this uh i mean not an unlimited budget not unlimited time but for a composer of sort of film and tv and stuff like that i imagine this must have felt like you know you, you've got a huge garden in which to play how did you go about from creating the building blocks what's what's the idea about you've got five season arc how do you go about doing that what did you do um the way I start every project is by writing themes. Um, I find that scoring drama, like looking at a scene, understanding what it needs to do, um, that takes a lot of energy. And to also like generate the foundational material at the same time is almost impossible for me. Uh -huh. So I usually will start a television you know, project with anywhere from three to four or five themes and then like maybe seven if you include little 
developmental ideas. Um, so I made a list. I go, I need my themes. I made a list. I read the whole season, watched the first two episodes, and I read all the way through the end of eight. And I was taking copious notes. You know what I mean? It was like uh-huh. drawing lines across because I'm I'm trying to condense as much as I can. Um, uh, I mean, there was the simplest version is like there's good and evil. That's it. There's good and evil, and like there's two themes, man. And you let every let the chips fall where they may. Uh, that's not gonna work. This person will need a theme. Uh, this faction. Ooh. This one, this one, this one. It ended up being 15 themes. Uh-huh. And in reality, it ended up being even more than that. I think, depending on how you count it, somewhere like 17 or 18. And I thought this was absurd. I thought there's no way. <laughs> there's no way I could keep it all straight. There's no way an audience could keep it all straight. This will come down. But it didn't. And I spent my first six weeks writing themes. I disappeared from the showrunners. I told them, you're not going to hear a note of this. I'm not going to play them for you. And you're not going to even hear from me. So bye. You know? <laughs> um, but I, but, but I felt very strongly and I learned this working with Lindsay and JJ um, playing themes in advance um, takes away a showrunner's ability to have the experience you have as a viewer. Mm. I had an experience on one of the Cloverfield movies. Right, it was like JJ, check out my theme, and I was like, "That's so cool, man!" And then I was check out this big opening scene, and we watched it, and he was like, "Uh huh," and he looked at me and he goes, "You know, you're cheating, right?" I go, "What?" And he goes, "If you hadn't played me that theme, I would have never known there was a theme there," and I was like, "Damn it!" Uh, <laughs> so uh, that's what I did, and I just I wrote the themes, and I I was it's an art form in that you are. You want to write a theme that emotionally tells you the essential information. So in my list, it's like, who is the person or the, it was a person, a place, or a society, person, society, or a narrative idea. Those are the three things that I wrote themes for. What is it, what should it feel like? Um, you know, if it's Galadriel, what, what do we want to feel about her? You know, and I'm just writing words like heroic, driven, um, uh, you know what I mean? Like, um, obsessed, um, but, but good, you know, just oh. basic broad strokes. It's just sort of like, okay. Then once I had that for everybody, I wrote musical traits. This is where it starts to transition from just the art into almost a, a craft. This is just the craft of it. Um, and they all had to be different. That's, ultimately the biggest challenge when you sit down and you write even three themes in a row. I can't tell you how many times that I've gone, all right, I've got two themes, the good guy theme and the bad guy theme. Great. Here we go. And then later on into the season, something happens with the good guy and they, or or girl, I remember this happened on Battlestar with um, with, uh, uh, Kara Thrace. That that Uh, must've been a problem. Everyone's changing sides there. (laughs) I know that. Yes, exactly. And those themes were very simple and didn't have some of the things that these themes have by design. Um, but then it's like when you have a heroic theme and then you go, oh, then it, let's make it the dark version. And then I realized like, oh my God, it, it is the bad guy theme now. Like mm-hmm. they weren't different enough. They have to be constructed so that you could do a happy, sad, heroic, dark, twisted, or triumphant version. And in all of those cases, all those variations of the Galadriel theme are utterly unmistakable from 14 other themes that all have their different variations that are all unmistakable from all the others. Um, so then I started getting into my tricks to do that. Color, what are some sounds? Are there specific instruments, orchestral techniques, choral techniques for solo singers that I use only for this theme? Uh, we've already mentioned uh, the Hardinger fiddle and the nickel harpa, which are Nordic folk instruments that I used for the Southlands, for low men. Is that a nod to uh, to Rohan? Maybe. It could also be that my daughter is right, and that just sounds like your music. Do you know what I mean? Like that, <laughs> I mean, that's because it's God yeah. of War, it's Outlander, it's even like Battlestar, that like these stringed Northern European folk instruments have a scratchiness and a rawness that is endearing to me. You know, like, so I took one look at the Southlands, but also, like, Rohan's part of that connection. So I don't even know, man. I don't, I don't even know. That's the Mobius strip of influence in my brain. 
Um, and But I only use those for the Southlands. I don't use them, well, it's not entirely true, but in certain combinations, I only use them for the Southlands. So you hear that. Um, and I, it's almost like it's Pavlovian. I'm just teaching you. We meet the mm. Southlands. Ba, 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 ba. Oh, here's this guy on the raft. Ba, 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 ba. It's just, mm -hmm. it is, I'm, I'm being very literal. I'm not trying to be subtle in any way. And I'm doing that to help you. So that's what I did. I came up with 15 themes. Mm -hmm. and, and then I started scoring scenes and started showing them to the showrunners. And I didn't play them the themes in advance. And they got to have an authentic experience, um, which empowered them to be able to give me feedback that was meaningful. Because if most of the time it was great. V1 mm -hmm. of Casa Doom, V1 is what went on the air. And that was the this one of the first cues I played them was Elrond walking in and the bum 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 and then the 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 you know the feed ended we we're doing it digitally like this and uh, there was this delay I think because of the the a lag and I was like oh my god do they hate it and then they all just stood up and started clapping you know <laughs> I was like oh my god like that's there's a cue review for you um but Elrond changed a bunch Elrond had exactly that thing that I told you that happened with JJ happened with them. We meet Elrond and the elf comes up and is like, Hey, you're not part of the ceremony. And by the way, your friend's here. He goes there and they were like, that's really, it's really pretty. Yeah. Is so does Elrond have a theme? And I was like, uh Oh, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like rut row. If you can't hear that. Mm. I, and I even said to them, I go guys, yes, but I'm not even going to play it for you. Or sing it to you because if you didn't hear it in that scene i haven't done it right and then we started talking about what it was we wanted to say about elrond and the two got a little closer and it still didn't work the three i got it so so how did that interaction work i want to come back to the themes in just one moment but how did the interaction with the showrunners with i don't know the writers work was it sort of feedback on a Yes, on a theme by theme basis, but was it on a like a, a scene by scene basis? Did they say here we want a lot of emotion for this scene, that one we want to slow yeah. the pace down because we're coming up to a crescendo? What how how did that actually work? The the process of scoring media of any type uh involves uh like a, it's like a three three step process to get the cube finished. Hmm. First, you spot a spotting session. I think of it like, where is the spot where music goes? And you talk yeah. about in advance all the things you just said. Should it crescendo here? What do you want it to do? There's a trick I've learned from my mentor, Elmer Bernstein, who scored the Ten Commandments and heavy metal and Ghostbusters and Animal House and everything in between. I was his last protege, worked with him for a decade. One of the things I learned from him is there's only one question you ever need to ask a filmmaker, ever. Um, you say, what do you want the audience to feel here? You mm. always get the truth. You never ask, what kind of music do you like? What do you think of the temp? Should it swell? Should it be a clarinet? Never. What do you want the audience to feel? And I'm like clockwork, if there's ever any confusion. So I'll ask that question. What do you want the audience to feel? And indeed, that was clarifying Elrond in that sequence mm. I described. What do we want the audience to feel? Um, that was the question. Then I go and write and I do mock-ups uh, you know, working working here in like a digital environment uh, and make something that sounds to the lay person like a finished product. My mock-ups sound pretty rad, you guys. Um, <laughs> so then I play them and th that's really that's really where the work is done. Um, we do what I call a cue review where we watch the scenes together and then we don't have to talk about hypotheticals. Then a showrunner or a director or a producer can say, I really respond with this. I don't like that. What is happening here? And then I go, yeah, okay, let's, let's change all those things. So rinse and repeat over and over and over and over. That's how this is done. Um, that process usually remains in place all the way to the end. Interestingly, on the Rings of Power, I found that we were so on the same page that after the second episode, I said, guys, do we even need to spot this? We're just kind of hanging out and like talking about, I'm talking about what is so inherently obvious in your drama because it's so well cut together. And then I'll, I don't really have to ask you what you want. And then everything I pitch, 
I'm like, oh, I would do this. They go, oh, that sounds great. You should do that. They're, they're, we were so in sync that we just stopped. And they, and I mean this not to say that they don't know what they're doing. It's that they had hired the right person who was already in their headspace. And it was literally mm. a waste of everyone's time to spend five hours going over an episode and just basically, basically we were all saying like, yeah, I get it. So we didn't spot. They just sent me the episodes. And then most of the time I didn't send them anything until it was all done. I go, here's the, here's episode three, top to bottom, watch it, give me your notes. And then even really soon, I think after episode three, they just emailed notes. Mm. I mean, I'm telling you, man, it was like surreal that, I was writing the most expensive show in the history of the medium in my little space here. And it was almost like, just send me the footage. I'll send it. You give me one round of notes via email. And it's like, and again, it's not to say that they didn't know what they were doing. Their notes were incredibly insightful and they made me a better composer. They made me a better writer for film and TV because we immediately got to get past all the kind of superficial stuff that so often happens. Um, they let me do what I wanted to do. And the notes they gave me, like with Elrond, uh, made it better. They never shaved off the edges or said like, oh, I don't know, that's a little scary. Actually, that's not even true. One time, a couple of times I did scare them. Uh, and even it was like all the Middle Eastern stuff in Numenor. They were mm -hmm. like, I, I just think anticipating like, are you, that is way outside the palette. And I just said, let me do it. Hang with me. Yeah. Hang with me on one round. You know what I mean? And they trusted me and I trusted them as they would say, you know, that Elrond theme isn't working. And I would be like, all right, I'm just going to, I'm not going to argue. I'm just going to trust and throw it out and like start over. You know what I mean? It was an incredible experience, but to go back to Lindsay Weber, that's what it's like when you're doing stuff with JJ at Bad Robot, that sort of like trusting, safe, small environment where it's like, okay, let's just get all the five people in a room, editor, VFX, sound designer, composer, director, producer, that's it. And let's just make, we just want to make a movie and make it great. Mm. Um, it's a no bullshit process that allows me to write something that only in that kind of environment can I write a score that is like really good. That is outside of what you could normally do on a TV show, which is great. I can do that too. And many projects that I've done fall in that category. Do you know what I mean? But this, you couldn't write a score like this and then get a bunch of like notes from people that were nervous and wanted it to sound like uh, uh, a Marvel movie or something. Do you know what I mean? Like, ooh, that's got a lot of personality. Can we shave the personality off? So it's a miracle. It's a miracle <laughs> of storytelling that that they let me do it. And that's truly, the thing is, you guys, everybody's like, wow, you you did that. But really, like, the reason I could do it is they let me do that. And that it really took both sides of that equation um, for that to um, for that to materialize, you know, not to fault the way other TV shows are made. There's a lot of cooks in the kitchen and that everybody's got a voice. And sometimes it's scary to have a different sound, you know, and 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 it's it's very easy to go, oh, here's a hit movie that just came out last year or a hit TV show like check out what they did. We should do that. Right. I don't blame them for thinking that I get it. Uh, this so, so I, the, what I'm hearing from you, which I think is excellent is that you were, you were basically given creative freedom. You could start from scratch. You were given uh, feedback as you were going along, but allowed to do what you want in the way that you wanted to do it. And then uh, perhaps we could talk about it later, but later on in the process, you have the best recording studios, you have uh, excellent musicians. So you, this yeah. is your baby. This is this is all your stuff. But I, 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 I wanted. To, oh, go on. I was just going to say, I think for the first time in my career, that I could point to a project and say completely truthfully, if there's anything you don't like in it, that's on me because that's mine. That is exactly what I want from day one. It's what I wanted to say. And I got to say it, even the way it's mixed and the way it's presented that ran through me. They, they, mm. I did a pass of mix notes before the showrunners heard the mix, Robert, that's never happened before. Mm. So, so like 
what I'm saying is like every other project has had some compromise. That's part of the job. It's it's a collaborative medium. So uh, any project, even ones I'm incredibly proud of, if there's a fan that's like, what about that part? I don't say it publicly, but deep down inside, I'm like, I know. What do you think? I don't know. You know, like, <laughs> I know that could have been better. Of course, that could have been better. Not rings of power, man. So in a weird way, it's like, if you don't like it at me, you know what I'm saying? Because it's like I stand by every second of it proudly. And that's that's just a miracle. That is that you don't you don't go into this business ever expecting that to happen. And it happened. Well, I, I think it shows, to be honest. I think it really does show. Uh, I think that shows the heart of you has gone into this, and, and I think that's what people are responding to. Um, I want to pick up on the themes, though, just as the building blocks here. You said on your blog, I'm going to – there's going to be a link down there. I, for those who don't know, Bear, Bear's just started, I think, a, a, a blog. Um, I just started uh, blogging about – rings the blog oh, yeah just blog for like almost 20 years man it's crazy uh, well the the rings blog i mean i don't care about your yeah. right, I'm joke um but i the uh the ring stuff i think you've done three uh big blog posts about uh about the rings of power and they're really interesting so i'd highly recommend you go and check them out one thing which uh you mentioned there was about Durin's theme just as an example of how you built this up and what you're trying to tell us and I wonder whether you could just talk a little bit about when you were constructing, as an example, Durin's theme, what is it that you're trying to tell us as an audience through the music, through the theme, and what are the different layers that are there? That's a great question. And he's a perfect archetype for a form that is replicated in every society. Um, what I'm going to say for the, uh, uh, for the dwarves applies to the elves, applies to Numenor, applies to the kingdom of low men and applies to the orcs. Mm. In all cases, there's a musical language that is built upon a foundation of orchestra and choir. That's everywhere. But then there's instruments that are specific only to that culture. There's musical traits that are specific only to that culture. I call them anthems, almost like a national anthem. When we walk into Casa Doom, we hear the anthem of that society. In all our societies, we have a sort of leader character. That leader represents the status quo. When King Durin III walks down the stairs and into our homes and on our screens, I don't need to introduce his theme. It, it, he is Kazadun. Mm. Bum, 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 bum. It feels um, nationalistic and patriotic and somber. When we walk into Casa Doom, it feels mighty and it feels um, industrious. Um, there's an emotional component to it, the B theme. Da 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 da. Not coincidentally, the one time we've seen thus far that King Doran really lowers his guard and embraces his son, boom, that's what you hear, like clockwork, the B theme. Before we go back to the Bum, 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 bum. Hope you do right by me, son. You know what I mean? Like there's this. Yeah. All right. In contrast with that, we have Prince Durin during the fourth. And he's got a lot of the same colors. There's a jauntiness to the music that supports his theme. But his theme actually has this a little more of a Celtic flavor, actually. Bum, 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 da, da, da. Da, 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 do, dum, bum, bum. It bounces more. Da, 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 da. It has this lift. I mean, I, I literally kind of go like, yeah. It has this connection, this warmth um, that the Casa Doom theme doesn't have. Um, it tells us that there's more going on here, which is revealed immediately with his relationship with Elrond. Um, it's not a coincidence that we hear his theme when uh we i mean we hear it when he enters but it's very subtle when he's telling elrond why he's mad at him he's wounded and the celli come in ba, da, 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 da. and then it goes into this jaunty version it just has all these layers that the casa doom theme doesn't have and i think it tells you we are going to have a conflict between tradition and the outlier hmm. Uh, elves, same deal. Galadriel is the outlier. Numenor, exact same deal. 
Elendil and Isildur become the outliers. And, and in all these cases, the music of that place is introduced in a way that's like really beautiful and bold and anthemic. Numenor is a perfect example. But then it like twists. I mean, when King Durin walks down the stairs, there's an, an imposing presence to the theme that isn't there. And the same thing with um, Numenor as uh, Farazan and Muriel start to confront Elendil about his connection with the elves. Da, goes the minor. Da, 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 da. Oh shit, bad news. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because then it's like you create these conflicts. And just think about this. I have to be able to score in a way a conflict between two factions in Newman that you hear a contrast there different than the contrast here between two factions in Dwarves, different than the contrast here. And then as the show goes on, they're all going to mix and match as characters from Numenor cross paths with elves in, in the Southlands. And it's like, all of that has to be distinct. So it was at the end of the day, there was an art form. I told you in the beginning, my biggest mm. fear was that down the line, I would realize two themes were too similar and they would blur and there'd be an unforeseen connection. God forbid some fan goes, ooh, the Galadriel theme is actually, and they're already doing it, man. There's already some stuff. People are like, oh, listen to that. You know, it sounds like it's from this. And it's like, there's only 12 notes, man. I had to write 15 themes. Like sometimes that is true, mm. but then other times it's not. And I think I went to great lengths to make these as distinct as possible so that more often than not, if you hear, if you hear a connection, uh, it's intentional. It's intentional. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So, so um, going forward with these building blocks, it, we, when you have say two characters meeting, then you might have the two themes kind of like uh, mm -hmm. uh, moving apart uh, together and going apart or something like that. Is the idea also um, that the themes themselves can start to change over time? So taking Numenor, as a theme, you've already talked, this is very big and brash and uh, exciting, but clearly, uh, spoiler alert for anyone who's not read the books, but there's quite a big ending coming up for, for Numenor, which is perhaps not quite as bright and optimistic as you might think to start with. Is the idea that that, sh that theme is going to be slowly shifting over time? Is that the way that you do I this mean or those themes for everyone? It depends on your definition of slowly, Robert. Okay. Already in episode five, when when Cayman basically says to his dad, hey man, like you're just kowtowing to the elves. And he looks up and the room clears and he basically drops the mask and is like, do you think I don't know what I'm doing? I know exactly <laughs> what I'm doing. And it, it, there's this, the Numenor theme isn't subtly darker there. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Like if anything, it's just like, it's foretelling something. Also, when uh, Galadriel touches the Palantir and then she takes her hand off, then there's this high ethereal vocal quality that's normally reserved for the elves. It's the Numenor theme. And it feels like an echo, like 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 mm. death itself. So you know what I'm saying? Like these were these themes were designed to be able to do that. And you're already hearing it take place and then on the soundtrack album there's other experiments that you can hear that you're not going to hear this season for example uh elendil and isildur right um you listen to that track and because all these theme pieces on the album are about 50 minutes five zero minutes of the record was written and recorded just for the record yeah but it was all pulled from the show but i would just piece together ideas in a way to just create like the ultimate version of a track. But in some cases, I I had sketched out something that would happen later. And if you look at, um, you listen to Elendil and Isildur, there's the second half, the very end of that, you're not gonna hear that this season. And you're not gonna hear that next season. I mean, to me, I just, I, I wanted to write the theme for this outlier family. They're, um, you know, we don't know what happened to uh, Elendil's wife. We um, is uh, Isildur is lost. It's an intimate story now. Mm. But at the last alliance of elves and men, what might it sound like? 
listen to the soundtrack album. That's me trying that out. I want to hear what a huge, epic, tragic, operatic version of that theme would sound like. Now, how does that experiment pay off? When I wrote that theme, you know, you hear it in episode three, it's very small. But by the end of episode four, when the white uh, leaves of the tree are cascading across the city, you hear that theme in this big, epic version. I had already done the experiment to know that would work. I didn't I didn't want to get into episode four and suddenly go, oh dear, is my Elendil theme going to work? Um, so yes, I'm always thinking ahead about how those themes can evolve and uh, and twist and information that is embedded in the themes um, will come back later in, in, in ways that you'll hear this season and in ways you'll hear uh, later. So so to take the, the, the big example that you've already sort of hinted at, Elendil and Isildur, uh, if this ends roughly where we're, this is the second age show, so it will end roughly at the end of the second age, so we'll have the last alliance, we'll have the effectively the the scenes that we had at the very beginning of the, the flashback of the, the Fellowship of the Ring. Um, we've got lots of different characters going on there. We'll have Elendil, Isildur, Sauron will be there. We'll have uh, Elrond will be hanging around. We've got a One Ring theme that you've already sort of hinted yeah. at as well. It's lots of things. There. Yeah. Yeah. So we, so is, is in your mind, you might not have composed this already, but is the sort of the outline shape of what that kind of feel is that already there? Yes, and I have enough experience in my own writing process to know. When I see that footage, I think I'll be able to write something that captures the emotion. As mm. long as all the themes are distinct, Robert, it'll work. It'll work if I have established themes for all these characters. I mean, that is the thing that the opening flashback of Fellowship of the Ring cannot do, makes no attempt to do, and shouldn't do. Yeah. That, like, Nilendil falls, and then Isildur, and, 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 and you see Elrond, like, you can't, you cannot have an emotional response to that that early on with those mm. portrayals of those characters. It's just, that's not the function of it. So in a way, that's the goal for me. Like, it's, and I said that when I met these people. I was like, I, I literally said to them in my first meeting, can we make this the public reevaluation of Isildur? Like if you do nothing, <laughs> else, can we can we save this poor guy, man, who in the Peter Jackson films was so expertly crafted to do what he needed to do? And of course, that was the first thing they said. Oh, absolutely. You know, um, and uh, in order to do that, we need to connect with him. We need to connect with his father. Um, so yeah, I, that's, that's why those themes are so important and why they need to be, um, distinct. Um, you can already hear th an example of this where in, um, in episode six, the one that just aired or will have just aired. By the time. Well, I'm anyway, not to, to be clear, well, this I'll is just, before I've seen it, but know, by the time people see this, they'll have seen it. I'm not going to spoil it very much, but we do start seeing some <laughs> cross-pollination of characters that have been separated. And you will hear for the first time a theme, for example, for Arandia that has been in isolation here. Cross paths with two other character themes that you have not heard ever in proximity to Arandia's theme. And it's a big action scene. I can't, I don't have space for the English horn. I gotta use like brass. I just have the notes. And like you know, when Arondir's doing his thing, and then you hear dun 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 dun, bum 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 bum, and then dun dun Do you immediately go, yeah, you you get it? You know what I mean? And and combined with the visuals, you get it even more. But that's what I'm talking about. Those had to be designed to be different melodically so that that could work, and the whole thing would fall apart. If you were like, was that a was that a theme? And look, I don't mean to be cynical, but like so many movies that I go to today, movies in particular, where it's like, oh, is that is that a is that a theme for that superhero? You know what I mean? Like, not like it used to be, man. Where it's like, I mean, it's very easy to point to uh, Richard Donner's Superman with John Williams and Tim Burton's Batman with Danny Elfman, but for a while there, a very I mean, just two movies, I guess, but whatever. The idea was every hero has a theme that's super iconic that is an 
utterly unmistakable. You know what I mean? And that yeah. has, that's not really the style of the time anymore. So in a way, I definitely feel like I'm, I just want to circle back one more time and commend the showrunners for letting, not only letting me do that, encouraging me to do that and helping me do that. Anytime I stumbled, they caught me and would say, hey, that, that theme isn't, isn't working. Or another thing they would say is go, okay, character A came in and we heard their theme and character B came in and we heard their theme. Aren't they really talking about character C though, Bear? Aren't they? And I'd go like, oh my God, I missed the forest for the trees. You're right. Let me, you know what I mean? That's insight into thematic writing that you can tell these, these showrunners are, they're thinking about it the way I am. Good. And I want to, I mean, we're going to run out of time soon, but I just want to sort of cycle back or almost turn the last thing we talked about on its head. If we're talking about everything building up towards an end point, and you've done that thinking now to a degree already, that seems to imply that if we kind of work our way back, as you were sort of already hinted, there are some, if you know what you're looking for, there are some hints within what we've already had in season one about what is to come. Or, um, I'm not asking for spoilers here, but there are obviously a lot of mysteries that are in season one about who this character is, who that character is, and what's going on. So that leads to conspiracy theories, which I'm sure you've seen um, about, you know, oh, Bear McCreary's clearly done this uh, in order to show us that this character is Sauron or that character is Sauron. Is, will we be able to go back afterwards and say, ah, I see what he was doing there because he did so this sort of bit thing musically at this point that is hinting about this character being whatever? Yes. <sighs> Okay, so that's, um, is, are there, I saw ages ago, <laughs> you, there, there, so I'm trying to figure out where man. to get with this. you're getting, man. No, 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 but so I saw a tweet ages ago from someone um, about uh, Sauron's theme, uh, which, and they said something along the lines of, this has got nine notes plus then a, a tenth, I can't remember the exact phrasing, but a discordant note or something like that. And uh, this is clearly, Bear is showing us this is leading up to the uh, the, the creation of the rings. Um, and you actually replied to that, saying something like, I can't possibly comment on that, but there are Easter eggs here or words that affect. Yeah. Is, are there a lot? What can you say now before... Where are you, yeah, episode five? Yeah, six. no, what, I mean, uh, you know, I, 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 I love all kinds of like deep, like nerdy little clues. Mm. Um, I would just say, you know, to the person that wrote that tweet, it's like close but no cigar. You're barking up the wrong <laughs> tree. Okay, okay. I, I am a very um, intuitive and emotional writer. I. I have done stuff to bury codes in music. I did it on Da Vinci's mm -hmm. Demons. I definitely did it on Battlestar because the narrative necessitated that I do it. Um, mm. uh, no spoilers for that, but check it out for a really cool integration of deep musical construction and narrative. Um, yeah. But at the same time, I also find it um, it is is so esoteric that, that and, and, and intellectual that it's sort of like I don't know it it becomes almost pointless to me so like yes it's all but it's almost like like in some cases the the the, the forest has been missed for the trees and sure. um there's there 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 are some things in the score there are some things in the score that have been intuited uh just seeing what I'm tagged in um accurately and there's a lot that hasn't been and there's a couple, no one's found yet. No one's found. Them. Okay. To the point that I'm, I'm a little, I'm, I'm a little surprised. <laughs> wow. I mean, we can talk about it later, man. But I'm just saying, like, there, there, there are, there, there's some things in there that I think are, um, that are very intentional, um, and uh, not even coded as deep as like the whole, like, oh, the number of notes and all that stuff, you know, because mm. it's like. To me, like getting into the number of notes and all that kind of thing, again, with the exception of Battlestar, with the literal exception of that, where the number of notes mattered, it's like, you know, Sauron's theme, it's like, what is Sauron's theme? Is it da 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 da? 
Or is it da 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 Then there's a B theme. And then it comes back. And then in that, there's da 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 You know, like, so even to say, like, the number of notes, this is where you get into, like, the tinfoil hat stuff. Because it's like, at any point, you could go, you could say there's a meaningful thing at 21 notes. You're like, oh, there it is. But it's like, but it keeps going. You know what I mean? I will just say that in the... um numerology is like a thing that I use to help uh, create distinction and that Sauron is in a mixed meter uh, um, where his ostinato, his pattern is in seven. You can't tap your foot and stay on beat. It like throws you off. And then his melody has these elements that are in four. So then it's like straight and then it goes back to seven, four, seven. I'm not hiding a secret code. I'm telling yeah. you that he is twisted, that he is twisting, that he is manipulative, manipulating. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's an emotional thing that it's like um, he has an unevenness that implies attention. The other characters that have an unevenness, again, not related, uh, the Harfoots are in 11. Gung, 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 dun, dun, dun. Dun, 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 it's, but to me, that's part of the discomfort where the Shire is comfortable. The Harfoots, I was imagining one of those big cartwheels that's got a crack in it and it's a clunk. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Like their, their life is uneven and off kilter, but they keep going, they keep moving along. So these are like, I do use patterns and numbers, very intentional. You, you know what I mean? Um, I try to make sure that, that I have a variety of meters and, and um and stuff like that but but yes uh getting too deep into it is the i mean in some ways i say you know you're not looking deep enough and in some ways i'm like you're looking too deep so it's just it is interesting but i suppose that's that's all i can really say about that at the moment well what i'd love is for you to come back after the show's ended, after season one's ended, and, and we can actually discuss these because I know that there's there's a lot in there that we can then go back and you can point out, you did not notice that. Here's that clue to who, where is Sauron? This is what's going on with the stranger. That kind of thing, you will have been thinking about that as composing it, and it would be lovely to pick your brains on, on how that process worked. Uh, that'll be a lot of fun, and I'm actually just curious to see what else people hear and um and what else they find i do want to say like as fun as all that is in a way the fact that i haven't seen anybody catch uh catch the big fish that i put in there two big fishes actually <laughs> actually the one big fish someone i've seen someone someone figured it out the 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 thing i was alluding to earlier about the uh about the ring theme has yeah. that has been uncovered i just didn't acknowledge it um which is cool but, but in both cases, it's like, I want you to have an emotional experience. I I, sure. I hope every single person that's like, oh, let's go back and listen, go back and listen. If you are thinking about any of this when you're watching, I didn't do my job correctly. Because my job is to immerse you in Middle Earth, in the story, in the emotion. I don't want you to, in, I don't want you to be aware of any of this. I hope that is clear. That it's, I'm, I'm not, I'm not here making intellectual puzzles. Or, yeah. or leaving trails of breadcrumbs. I, I, I want to make you cry. I want to make you scared. I want to warm these characters up to you. I want to go on a journey with you. I want to take you somewhere. And for those who are interested in how we do that, uh, I'm here, man. We can talk about it. Absolutely. Well, I hugely appreciate this. And in terms of the emotion, there have been some things that um, have really, I mean, personally, I, can, I know everyone's had different things. As I thought in the last episode where you had that cut to, uh, um, uh, I forget exactly that, is it Sophie Nonvete, the uh, Disa who's who's singing to the, the mountain, that worked absolutely wonderfully for me. Other The, the Harfoots traveling song, uh, the that, again, yeah. beautiful. So there, there are so many parts of this that do uh, create emotion. So I think you definitely have, have been doing that. And I love the Casa Doom and Numenor and a few other themes as well. But anyway, I could carry on talking about this for ages. Thank you so much for coming on. Is there, if, if people are here thinking, wow, I just need more Bear, Bear McCreary in my life, where, where do they go? Uh, you can go to my site and dig deep into my blog if you want to get super nerdy. Otherwise, um, follow me on Twitter and Instagram uh, and 
Facebook if you're my age or older, I guess. Uh, I don't know who's on Facebook anymore. Um, but uh, and I'm hoping to do more like live streaming and 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 stuff. I mean, I'm I've I've been um, I'm curious, you know, if, if people want more of that from me. I think this is it's sort of something that I'm open to do. But for now, yeah, Twitter, Twitter and Instagram for sure. And there's a lot of cool music coming out in the next year, um, non Lord of the Rings related. And and uh, and if if you are discovering me through Lord of the Rings, I think there's a lot of stuff that I've done um, that uh, that you might really dig. This is this is uh, this is not an outlier for me. Like uh, you know, doing a big thematic um, orchestral thing. It's just that this is on like a just a bigger canvas. So yeah, I don't know that, that, that that's where I would send them. Excellent. And the, the music itself, the rings of power is wherever you'd normally get your music. I was listening to it on Spotify. Uh, and that, is worth, that is worth mentioning that right now, every time an episode drops on Amazon prime, the full score for that episode is available on Amazon music. The uh, on Spotify and title and every other place is like the soundtrack for the season, mm -hmm. which is sort of, sort of a greatest hits. But uh, after all the, sh after they've been on Amazon for a little bit, when all the episodes drop, the episodics will be available everywhere as well. So uh, no matter where you listen to your music, you have the ability to listen to nine hours plus of Lord, Lord of the Rings music that I wrote and, and there's more coming. So uh, yeah, check it out. Fantastic. Well, thank you again so much. Um, I'm really looking forward to uh, you coming back and explaining all of those things you've been teasing us about. Um, uh, but I hope everyone has been enjoying this as much as I have. Uh, thank you again. I will see everyone again soon. Take care.